Good morning. Welcome in Jesus' name. It's good to be gathered together and great to worship together today. And isn't it nice to have the sun showing? It's always up there, but it's nice to have it showing today and to have that bright sunshine. If you'd take a look here, we've got a number of things to make note of. Um, if we look at the weekly calendar and just the time ahead, I just want to remind you, you're all invited to come back for a game time today at 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. You can bring games with you, and it's a time that way. No phones allowed, all right? No phones allowed, just games in that way. But it'll be a good time to be all gathered together, and uh, all ages are welcome to that. Um, youth group tonight, um, as you look ahead, the women's Bible study, the quilting. Wednesday's a full slate of things. Um, and uh, Friday and Saturday this coming week, just to make note of, is the District Midwinter Bible Conference. It's over at Badger Creek, so it's not far away. And uh, you have an insert in the bulletin, and you have the times there, and I would encourage you to come and take part. Um, Jason Goodham is a very good teacher. He is an adjunct sometimes at our seminary and our Bible college, and uh, he, he's a former member of our youth group back in North Dakota, so that tells you how old I am with regards to things, but Jason does a wonderful job um, with teaching-wise. If you flip that over real quick, there's a mission conference coming up in Thief River. Um, I know that's a little ways to travel, but on that set Friday there's a session, but then Saturday is a full slate of things, and uh, Pastor Andy Coyle, um, some people are related to him in here, in that regards, um, he'd be uh, uh, Judy Fugelberg's grandson, if you're wondering with that regard of things. Um, but Andy does a great job of things. I think he's preached here before, but he's the home mission director now. And also you'll notice that there's a choir concert, the Free Lutheran Bible College Proclaim Choir. There's two choirs. The Proclaim Choir has a concert, and the men's quartet will be there as well. So it's a neat opportunity for that Saturday um, for you as well, if there's something you'd like to get, get off, get, go to in that way. Um, the uh, calendar is in the bulletin this week as well, and you'll notice there's a, a lot of different, a lot of things on the calendar, and the opportunities are noted on there. I do want to make note of one thing that I've added to the calendar, and that is if you notice every Wednesday there's the men's breakfast that moves from different church to church. But I'd like to start Wednesday mornings just offering to you um, guys, both men and your boys as well. They could come at 7 o'clock on Wednesday mornings, CFB we'll call it. Um, that stands for Coffee, Food, and Bible. <laughs> just a little bit of time will be done within an hour, but a good time of mainly fellowship, just talking together and things that way, laughing a bit and things there. But it's an opportunity. We'll give it a shot, see how it goes. Um, I need time with guys as well, and so it's a good opportunity for us. In that way, if three people show up, I'll be good. If 25, that's fine too. Either way, we'll have a good time um, from 7 to 8 o'clock. So it's a neat opportunity just on Wednesday mornings um, along those lines. The prayer list is there in the bulletin. You'll notice a lot of things in the prayer list. I want to encourage you to keep praying. Um, Barb Smedsmo asked me that you'd pray for her sister Judy. Starts her seven weeks of chemo this week, and she's going through things that way. Marty Johnson has surgery this Wednesday um, for his colon cancer, and you can be praying for him. In that way, that's down in um, Rochester taking place. Um, pray for Bob as he's back in the post-surgery and all the healing and stuff that way as well for Bob and Carmen. Um, and Dawson had to go back to um, Rochester and have surgery again because some of infection within his incision and things that way, and they had to move, they, they got some muscle to cover one thing, and then they, but he's got a wound vac on now, so you can be in prayer for Dawson in that way, but be praying that that pain and things would come down for him. <coughs> also, he starts his chemo and all that coming up here really soon too, so be in prayer. He's gone through a lot, and a lot to still go, a long road to hoe, so keep praying that way. Any other prayer requests or announcements to make this morning? Yes. We got our total in for the shoe boxes, eleven million three hundred and thirty thousand one hundred and twenty six boxes. Eleven million three hundred and thirty thousand one hundred and twenty six shoe boxes total. Up by seven hundred and thirty thousand two nineteen since last year. Okay, so over seven hundred and thirty thousand more than the year before. So let me put last year. So 
we can praise God for that, yeah, as we go forward. Anything else today? On f okay, Robert has Robert Johnson has back surgery this Friday. Okay, okay, is that Den Fargo or Grand Forks? Minneapolis. Minneapolis. So down in Minneapolis. So be in prayer for Robert in that way too. A lot of things to pray for, isn't there? Let's talk with God as we begin. First of all, Lord, we just come to you and want to praise you for who you are and how you're with us in each of these things and with, with all the different needs that are out there. But we need you, Lord. We need you today more, more than ever, as always. We need you each day. And uh, we pray for all these things that we've talked about this morning, um, for physical healing in all these different instances. We pray for that. We thank you for those that work with people in those ways, too. Um, we do pray for that patience that's needed, too, as we wait and, and go through the different things. Think of that for Bob and for Dawson. We pray for the surgeries up ahead, ahead for Marty and for Robert. And uh, we just lift all those things before you. <laughs> and uh, we thank you, Lord, that you promise to be with us each step of the way. This world throws a lot of things at us. And uh, we thank you for the mercies you show us and the grace that you offer to us. That we can have that assurance of knowing you as our Savior and that your righteousness, your blood, can cover our sin. Lord, help us to go forward in you today and may the worship that we bring, may the, our words that are sung, said, our lives that are lived, May they honor you. May we glorify you. We pray these things in your name. And thank you again, Lord. Amen. I'll call on our worship team to lead us in some worship. Do it all. Does it work? Is it on? Is it on? You could all please stand, and um, if you're able to. Um. <laughs> Reading the first seven verses of Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us do bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. To worship, come, now, now is the time to give your heart, come, just, just as, as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, willingly we 
choose to surrender our lives. Willingly our knees will bow. With all our hearts, our mind, and strength, we gladly choose you now. school we talked about um, the story in, in Matthew 18 where you have the two debtors and the man that owed the king um, an exorbitant amount of money and then the man that owed him not that much in comparison and um, just what that means for forgiveness how we have been forgiven so much in comparison to anything that somebody could owe us and what God has done for us. And so um, I ask him as you sing this song that it would just really be um, your prayer and of uh, thankfulness for what God's done. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending I've been 
set me free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever Will be forever mine. You are forever mine. Oh Lord, we thank you for what you have done on the cross for us, that you have forgiven a great, great debt, and that you give us life with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Let's take a moment as we've been reminded of that great debt that's been forgiven, that we come to him just as we are again today. And we confess our sin knowing he forgives. It's his blood, his righteousness. So let's do it together. The confession's up on the screen. There are page 48 in the hymnal. Join me if you would. Gracious God in heaven, we bow before you to confess to you that we have sinned and done that which is evil in your sight. We have walked in pride. We have not been as thankful or forgiving as you would like us to be. Help us to show forth the fruits of your spirit, the love, joy, and peace that you have shown to us. And forgive us for all our wrongdoing, even those stubborn habits that we struggle with. For we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I'll call upon our scripture reader today. The first reading this morning is found in the book of Amos, chapter 6. Woe to the complacent. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation, to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Kalna and look at it. Go from there to Great Hamath, and then go down to Gath in Philistine, and they better off than your two kingdoms. Is their land larger than yours? You put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds inland with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fatted calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on music instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you'll be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. The Lord abhors the pride of Israel. The sovereign Lord has sworn by himself. The Lord God Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. If ten men are left in one house, they too will die. And if a relative who is to burn the bodies comes to carry them out of the house and asks anyone still hiding there, is anyone with you? And he says no, then he will say, hush, we must not mention the name of the Lord. For the Lord has given the command and he will smash the great house into pieces and the small house into bits. Do horses run on the rocky crags? Does one plow there with oxen? But you have turned justice into poison 
and the fruit of righteousness into bitterness. You who rejoice in the conquest of of Lo, Lo de Burr, and say, Did we not take Carmen by our own strength? For Lord God Almighty declares, I will stir up a nation against you, a house of Israel, that will oppress you all the way. From Lebo Hamath to the valley of the Ariba. And the second lesson is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, 13 through 21. The parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Here ends the lessons. Thank you very much, Shirley, for reading that. And we're back to Amos this week, so we're going to be looking at the things that he has there for us as God brings his word. Let's confess our faith this morning using the words of the Apostles' Creed like we so often do. Let's proclaim it, these truths. So join me if you would. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue in worship by giving back to God with our tithes and offerings today. Lord God, again, we thank you for these gifts that will be given today. And uh, may we give with hearts, knowing that you have given us so much. May these gifts be used so that people may know you as their Savior, Lord. We pray in your name. Amen. <laughs> Gifts may be all 
that we have is thine alone. A trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. Please be seated. We'll call upon the Sunday school at this time for special music. And kids, if you want to stay up for the children's message after that, that would be great. I don't know about you, but it's always fun to hear the bells with the song, Seek Ye First, the Kingdom of God. What a wonderful, wonderful song that way. And uh, thank you for that. I have ringing in my ears all the time, so that just kind of added to it, which was great as we go along. But okay, guys, what number are we on today? Four. Number four. Have you guys been thinking about fours in the Bible all week? Yeah. Have you thought of any fours? What are some fours in the Bible? Yeah. Four birds. There probably are four birds at different times. You're probably right with things that way. Yes, Levi? Four Gospels. Four Gospels. What are the names of the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, the four Gospels. Theo? Um, four o'clock. Four what? Clock. Four o'clock. Four o'clock, yeah. It hit four o'clock a number of times in the Bible at different times. James, Numbers, the book of Numbers. You could say that every time when we're doing Numbers, couldn't you? 
What was the number, Shirley, today? It was like, the first number you gave was like, million, how many million? Yeah, 11 million something. It was a big number as we go along. Um, any other fours? I'm saving the best one for last year. Yep. There's a lot of chapter fours. You're right. Yeah. Uh, the bell four? The bells? Yeah. Four bells? I mean, that might be there somewhere. We're going to have to check that out. Do you guys have any fours? Oh, that's the best one. Four men in the fire. We talked last week, the three men in the fire were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when the king looked in, there was a fourth man in the fire and he looked like the son of God who was it probably it probably was Jesus and isn't it amazing that everything in the Bible points to Jesus he was that fourth man in the fire that was there that's with us through the fire or through the good times too um, you know what, what at Spruce somebody said that there were four nail holes in Jesus. That's true. There were four nail holes. There's a fifth hole with the spear, but there were four nail holes. Points to Jesus again, doesn't it? A lot of good reminders as we look at numbers. Now, since it's four, you guys can take four pieces of candy today, but you share two, and then you save two for the game time today, right? That sound like a good deal? All right, so we can do that at the end. But remember, everything starts pointing. When we get to 52, I'm not going to do 52 pieces of candy, just so you know. All right? If we go that high, we'll see. We'll see what we do. But there's 52 weeks in a year, so we'll see what goes. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for the gift of your eternal life. You gave your life so that we could have life with you. I pray for these kids that they would know you, that fourth man in the fire. Then they would know you are walking with them when things are easy and when things aren't so easy. But help them to grow in their faith, I pray. Amen. You guys can head on down. And no candy for Zeke. And no candy for Zeke. Yes, hear it. After church, you can get it. They'll bring it out. Okay. Let's sing the song before the message today. And this song is a very familiar song. And it's a reminder, Martin Luther wrote this many years ago, a mighty fortress is our God. So let's sing it together. <clears throat> a mighty fortress is our God. A
If you'd turn in your Bibles to Amos chapter 6, that's where we're going to spend our time. And the title of the message today is Secure In and Question Mark. That's really what we're looking at today. Where is our security? Remember now, we haven't been in Amos for a little while. Amos was that shepherd prophet from the southern kingdom who was sent to the northern kingdom of Israel, to Samaria, to preach the word of God and to prophesy about the coming judgment that would come upon them um, as Assyria would come and take them into captivity. And remember the purpose of why Amos is doing this is because God wanted his people to wake up, to come back to him. This was going to happen, but he was giving them that chance. This is that mother or father that's giving, it doesn't want to watch their child just walk over the cliff and to walk away. He wants them to come back, to know him. Even though this is going to happen, he wants them to be there. I I was thinking about this, and I thought about how, um, well, there's a story about some geese that were flying out of um, Canada, flying across northwest Minnesota, just happened to be flying across Roseau here, and um, one of the geese saw some other geese down on the pond. They were different than he was, but he decided to go down and he flew down to these geese that were down on this pond and he separated from his group and he stayed with those geese. They seemed really nice. They were rozo geese. They seemed pretty nice. So he stayed there and, and he decided to stay for a day, a week. Then he decided to stay for a whole month. Stayed for the whole winter with them. The man who owned those geese used to feed them quite well and things. So they were a different breed of geese. They, 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 were, they were heavy birds. They couldn't fly hardly at all. And so um, finally spring approached and he's with these geese and he sees the geese coming back again, going back to Canada. And he's like, oh, I'd... I'd love to be back up with them. And he tried to fly. He couldn't do it. So it was nice and comfortable there. So he just stayed. He stayed throughout that year. And he thought, I'll just go when they come back again. They came back again and he couldn't get off. And each year he would try with all his strength to go fly with those geese. Finally, he had forgotten totally about them. Didn't hardly see them when they came over anymore. He was happy right where he was. (laughs) The moral of the story is this, when you read the story, is that if if you're not careful over time, we can forget our high standards and be content with lower things. But one of the things that you see with the people of the northern kingdom of Israel is they got content with what they had. They became complacent. The main message of Amos 6 is complacency and pride. And it's what God wanted to wake the people up over. He wanted them to not be complacent, to not be caught in their pride. So first of all, who's complacent? Or how does this come into play? Complacent, if you look at the definition, it's being satisfied and unaware of possible dangers. You get so content where you are that you don't catch the dangers that come your way. You don't catch anything else and you miss the things around you. You get so pleased with yourself and all the advantages you have. It feels so good that nothing phases you anymore. (laughs) Well, let's look at these complacent people and what happened. What happens with complacency is you become presumptuous. Look there in verses 1 and 2. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. Or as it puts there, you're secure or you're complacent in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria. Go over to, he says there in verse 2, go over to Kelna and see and there go to Hamath and go to Gath. Are you better than those kingdoms? (laughs) See, their security and their complacency, they got secure in themselves, first of all, from a a spiritual standpoint. They were the people of Israel. 
They were God's chosen people. They showed up to worship now and then. They brought the sacrifices when they needed to. They were doing those things and they were God's people. What could happen to us? And then they were also complacent because things were going well. Those that were rich got richer. The, the, they had lots of comforts. <laughs> they had a good military. They had that advantage. They had that Samaria was located up on a big hill, the town of Samaria. It was one of those places that had a fortress around it. If anybody was going to attack, it would have been really tough. Only one approach. <laughs> so God challenges them in verse 2. He says, go check out these cities. Go check out Kalna. Go check out um, Gath. Go check out Hamath. To them, it would have meant this very thing. If they would have checked those cities in that day, all those cities had big fortresses at one time. And every one of those three cities had been besieged and torn down. And God says, you know, aren't you like those? Aren't you? Are you any better than any of those cities? They were presumptuous. God's saying, if, why should I preserve you if I didn't preserve them? He's trying to wake them up. They weren't any better than those other cities. And God asks us today, are we good enough in and of ourselves? <laughs> we aren't. We need to see that we need him. <laughs> it's not our goodness that gets us anywhere. It's God's goodness. <laughs> go, to the, go to that um, uh, next slide. Any of you guys know who that is? Man, at least the people in Spruce knew. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan. That's Shaq O'Neal, yeah. Or just the Shaq, or they call him Shaq. And things, seven foot one, 325 pounds, many um, NBA championship rings, playing for both Miami and for LA Lakers and things that way. If you meet Shaq, I mean, everybody knows who he is. Well, Shaq happened to be, and, and let me get the right date here, it was August... August 26th, in the year 2009, he happened to be in Washington, D.C. And he sent out a text to his friends. Um, he said, you know what? I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm going to go visit the president. He's a baller. It was Barack Obama at the time. I'm going to go visit him. So he wa waltzed up to the White House. Figuring since he had all the rings and everybody knew who he was, that he would get in no problem. He presumed. But if you go to the White House, what happens? If you don't have an appointment, you are not getting in. He tried. Secret Service would not let him in. He sent out the text later. He said, they wouldn't let me in. Why? <laughs> he presumed because of who he was. And we get to that point, we just presume because, hey, we've got all the stuff. We become complacent. In verse 3, it talks about being a procrastinating. <laughs> if you look at verse 3 in the text, it says, Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who caused the seat of violence to come near. Amos has been sh preaching again and again, prophesying that they would be taken into captivity. And the people are hearing this. They've heard the message from the different prophets that come to the northern kingdom. But they'd rather listen to the other prophets that are telling them, you're fine. <laughs> it's coming, so what? I'll deal with it later. Or I, it's not going to come in my lifetime. I'll wait till later. I, I know... I'll wait till I know that the end is near. Then I'll do it right before the end. <laughs> do people do that same thing today with God? I'll think about God tomorrow. I'm young right now. I need to go do and try all these different things. Sow my wild oats. 
Then when I get older, that's when I'll turn to God. <laughs> In the Bible, there's a few examples. One is Felix, and the Roman governor was with Paul when Paul was in captivity here, being taken to Rome. Along the way, he met with Felix, the Roman, Roman governor, in Acts 24. And uh, Paul talked to him, it says, about righteousness, self-control, and judgment that was to come. And Felix got afraid. The message of God started to do its work on his heart. And he was going on that. But he says to Paul, he says, that's enough for now. You may leave when I find it convenient. I'll send for you. We look for convenience today. When it's convenient, God, I'll change. When it's convenient, God, then I'll follow you wholeheartedly. But right now I want these things. 2 Corinthians 6 says, Behold, now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the favorable time. So many people wait. <laughs> And surely read from Luke chapter 12, the parable of the rich fool. Jesus told them that parable, that it, it was really good for the guy. All that was going, he decided in his heart. He decided, I'm going to build, tear down the barns, build bigger. And then he said, if you caught it right there, he said, you know what? I mean, things are going to, in Luke 12, you see it there, he said, um, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many a years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> Was it wrong that he had good crops? Was it wrong that he was going to build bigger barns? What was wrong was his heart. He was putting everything off. <laughs> None of us know the day. <laughs> I'll trust God later on. <laughs> Don't put off the day of doom. <laughs> Don't put off the day of salvation. Don't be a fool. <laughs> Verse 4, it talks about how we become self-indulgent, or they were, and it fits for us today. And by the way, there, and you look at verse 4, you lie on the beds inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs. You eat, I mean, eat the fattened calves. <laughs> I want to bring out to you the fault here is not the wealth. Never in the Bible does it say that it's wrong to be wealthy. It's not a sin to have wealth. <laughs> it's not a sin to lie down on ivory beds to eat the expensive food. Money in itself is not evil. What does 1 Timothy 6.10 say? It says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Some people are eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Money can be used for God. We need money to do things. We need things in our lives, but we forget who is the one who allowed us to earn all that money? We become self-indulgent. I, I, I earned this money. I should spend it myself. But the Bible says in Luke 12, 48, that to whom much is given, much will be required. <laughs> What's wrong is the heart. That's the key. And our actions meeting up with our words or that true belief. <laughs> By the way, you know, if we took the top 10% of people who are rich in the world, all of us in here are in that top 10%. Yeah, there's people who have billions and millions of dollars. They fit in those top little things. But all of us in here are in that top 10% in the world. I know I've maybe said that before, but it's true. <laughs> the matter is the heart again, but in verses 5 and 6, this gets even worse. They become indifferent. And these are good things. Don't get me wrong. Music is good stuff. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on your musical instruments. David played his harp. David did those things, and it was good things. But he did it to praise God. 
to worship God. And, and <clears throat> these folks were playing and they were not giving the glory to God, but they were doing it just for their own entertainment. By the way, is it wrong to be entertained? No, again, it comes to the matter of the heart, but if we're just doing things and we aren't realizing, we get complacent. <laughs> and all we're looking for is things to be good. <laughs> and he takes it even farther. They were partying like there was no tomorrow. Look at verse 6. You drink wine by the bowlfuls. <laughs> and you anoint yourselves with the, the finest oil. You get those... Expensive lotions. But you fail to grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Joseph, by the way, his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, were a part of the northern tribes. You forget to grieve. <laughs> you get so caught up in feeling good about things. They had so much time and money on their hands, they became consumed with themselves. They spared no expense in caring about them just for themselves. They <coughs> frequented the finest spas, had their bodies lathered with the finest oils. And again, it's not those things that are what's wrong, it's the heart. They became indifferent. They didn't grieve <laughs> over what was happening. They became insensitive. They came like, so what? Who cares? <laughs> they no longer reacted to the truth. They got as many things as they could just to distract themselves from the things that they didn't want to deal with. Instead of praying for people to come to know God, praying that God would work in their lives, they began to pray, oh, I just hope people feel good. They became numb. They tried to numb themselves as best they could from the real problems. They were just more concerned about being entertained. I could go through a whole set of things that Jeremiah does as he preaches to the southern kingdom. In Jeremiah 6, verses 13 and 14, it, there were the people that were there, from the least to the greatest of them, everyone's greedy for unjust gain of, and it's from the prophet all the way to the priest. Everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, where there is no peace. Even the pastors, even the priests, even the prophets were just saying, you're okay. It doesn't matter. Well, you can't heal wounds by saying that they aren't there. <laughs> Can I tell you, it's hard preaching these things. <laughs> Because preaching him to you, it's preaching right to me too. Complacency. It had hit them. They don't care about the declining state that's there. Even though they see everything else seems to be going fine in the community and their nation. Doesn't sound familiar at all, does it? I think of the Titanic. In the Titanic, they had enough um, lifeboats for, um, I forget if it's half of the people or for a quarter. Now, don't get, get me wrong. But the, that was part of the rules because the Titanic was thought to be unsinkable. And therefore, if something did happen to the Titanic, they were supposed to have all the different con the places that it wouldn't really sink so they could just haul the people off part at a time and then bring the lifeboats back and bring them away. But they got so comfortable in that, and what happened? It was sinkable. They got complacent. It, it, it killed more people in the Titanic tragedy. What killed people was the complacency. If we aren't able to keep the fire and the love for God going then slowly what happens is the coldness of complacency sets in in our lives. And eventually spiritual stagnancy and eventually spiritual death. Wow. Look at verse 7. Therefore, therefore, 
What does God say? You will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. God says it will happen. It will happen. So let me ask you, what's the real problem here? What is the real problem? I'm reminded of the man who told his doctor that he wasn't able to do all the things around the house like he used to be able to do. So he needed to be examined, and the examination was complete. And he said, now, doc, don't mince words with me. Tell me in plain English, what's wrong with me? And the doctor said, well, here's the plain English. You're lazy. Okay, he said, now give me the medical term so I can tell my wife. <laughs> Complacency is one such thing that it gets into every area of our lives. What's really wrong? What's the core problem? All these things are simple, but what's the core problem? The core problem is pride. It's arrogance. <laughs> it, we put ourselves and we above everything else. <laughs> and you know what it says in Proverbs 16 about pride? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride was the problem for Satan. Pride is our problem. We aren't willing to let God be God in our lives. See, if you go back to first one of the text, it speaks to them there, you notable men of the foremost nation. <laughs> They weren't notable and they weren't the foremost nation. But their pride was being laid into to try and wake them up. <laughs> what does it lead to? What does pride lead to? It leads to being insensitive to the needs of others. We get so caught up with ourselves. We deserve what we have. Others don't deserve. We've, we've got those things. We become so prideful that it leads us to not even notice other people anymore sometimes. Let me tell you a true story. The last thing that Sh Sh LaShonda Calloway saw before she died was people literally stepping over her to continue shopping as if nothing had happened. LaShonda had stopped to shop in a convenience store in Wichita, Kansas, when she was stabbed in an altercation. As she lay dying, a surveillance camera recorded no less than five people stepping over her to continue shopping. One person stopped briefly. They only stopped to take out their phone and take a picture of her. The police spokesman said it was tragic to watch. The fact that people were more interested in taking a picture with a cell phone and shopping for snacks than helping this innocent young woman is frankly revolting. The police chief said it this way, Norman Williams, he said, that's crazy. What happened? What has happened to the respect for life? <laughs> well, you're saying that would never happen in Roseau. We get so caught up that we don't even pay attention anymore. <laughs> we become insensitive. We become irresponsible. Not only in regard to the needy, but our own families, our neighbors, our church, our community, our government. There's work to be done, but we don't want to deal with it. Or we say, I've already done enough. Let's let other people handle it. We pull out. You know, I got my Reader's Digest this week. <laughs> There's a real life story in there about a, a, a family that, a, a husband and wife who got an Australian shepherd. Cute dogs, aren't they? <laughs> but that dog just had too much energy. They couldn't get it trained, so they sent it to obedience school with seven other dogs. And their dog didn't do very well in obedience school, by the way. But it came time for the final test. There was four competitions that they would do. And so when the husband sent the wife off with the dog, he's thinking, oh man, this is going to be a terrible time. But when she came home with the dog, the dog had four red ribbons for the four contests. 
And he's like, what in the world is our dog? And she stopped him right away and she said, she said, only one other dog showed up. <laughs> Nobody shows up today. We pull out. And we become oblivious then to danger. We're so in and of ourselves or we're so complacent in that sense. Our pride just keeps us there that I've done what I've done. I've done what I've done. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> if you look at 24, or, or sorry, if you look at verse 10 of the text, it goes through this whole thing about what happened with the 10 and the, how, all these different things, with the other things, but notice what it says at the end. When something even is done, it says, hush, we can't even, me don't mention the name of the Lord. In our world today, so often, if we bring up and try and bring God into this situation, what do people say? Shh, shh, can't bring, up, can't bring up religion. You can't bring up Christianity. We can bring up a lot of other things. <laughs> That's how it had become. When we go through all this, what can be done? What can be done? <laughs> I mean, the whole goal with what God is saying here is he... He wants them to wake up. That's the key, to awaken. <laughs> he wants them to awaken. He wants us to awaken, <laughs> to live, to live for him because of what he's done for us, to awaken to that danger. You look in verses 11 through 14, that's the whole point of the entire book of Amos, is to wake up. <laughs> God isn't doing this just because he wants to try and show how good he is. He, he wants it because he wants us to wake up. He wanted the people of northern Israel to wake up. They were going to be judged. That, that was going to happen, but he wanted them to wake up. Look at verse 11. You see the Lord's command. The Lord has given the command. He will smash the great house into pieces and the small house into bits. It's going to happen. In verse 12, he even uses obvious things. He says, do horses run on rocky crags? Do you take them out, run your horses on rocky crags? <laughs> up in the mountains like that? Or do you plow up there with your oxen? The obvious answer is no. <laughs> but you've turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into bitterness. Well, what do we need to do? We need to recognize that God is God. <laughs> to recognize him as God. To let him be Lord. We need to humble ourselves. <laughs> Turn from sin. Ask God for that help and see what he has done for us. <laughs> and we need to get busy. We need to be doers of God's word. Read, it, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll... Grow, grow, grow. It's a Sunday school psalm, but it's the truth. Do something. Be doers of God's word. May the fact that you believe, may it match up with what you do and live. In Revelation chapter 3, it's said to the one church, the church of Laodicea, I know your works, I know you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold nor hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. <laughs> you know that later on it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. <laughs> he wants to be a part of things. And in, in Proverbs chapter 6, we should take a little note, a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise, though they have no, um, no prince or a ruler to make them work. They labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. But you, lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? <laughs> Romans 12, 11, it says, don't be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. <laughs> if we honestly examine our hearts, do you think we've fallen into that abyss of complacency? We all have at times. Don't you suppose we are self-sufficient? We get self-indulgent? We lack that compassion for others. 
What do we need? What do we need? We need revival. We need to be woke up. When you're a kid, did you did, when you would you like to stay in the bed a little longer? Who usually had to come and wake you up? Who wakes you up, Ivy, in the morning? Or do you wake up yourself? Oh, she wakes up by herself. That's the wrong person to grab. <laughs> Who wakes you up, Levi? Your alarm clock does. All right. Or sometimes the parents go down. Now, if you were younger and you had a brother or sister who needed to get you up, they found ways to wake you up. <laughs> Tim, I'm looking. I'm guessing you woke people up in different ways at different times. We need to be woke up, don't we? To be woken up from our pride and from our, from our <laughs> complacency. And what's the cure to all this? We need to do that heart check. <laughs> it depends on our heart. The Bible says, out of the overflow of our heart, the mouth speaks. With our heart is what we believe. We need to have that heart check. That's what the doctor checks out. Do a head check. What controls our thoughts and our mind? Take every thought captive, the Bible says. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And we need to do that spiritual health check where what is the, the spiritual vital signs? What do they say? Check our spiritual temperature, our blood pressure, our respiration. Then make a determination. Are we alive or are we dead? Is Jesus still alive? <laughs> you bet. What does this all come down to again? <laughs> it all comes down to Jesus and what he did for us. And it all comes down to whether we believe. That's where the check, the checkup comes. So where is your security? Who are your, you secure in? Are you secure in all the things you have or the people, your friends, the, the, all the things around you or your possessions? Or are you secure in Christ? I was reminded again of that this week with self-esteem. It's good to have self-esteem, isn't it? But you know, if our self-esteem is based in ourselves and what we've done, all the things, eventually it's going to fall off somewhere. But if our self-esteem is based in Christ and we have Christ's esteem, we have life. And even though we have the ups and downs, He doesn't change. That's what it comes down to again. Let's pray. Lord, awaken us. <laughs> Lord, awaken our hearts to you again. May we go forth trusting you. <laughs> help us through the bumps that we have along the way. And help us to enjoy and to serve you because of what you've given to us. To take in the fact the sun is shining today and to take in what's happening around us to help others and to feed our souls with all those things that you have for us. Lord, awaken us to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing song. And I hope it's a response for you and the fact that you can say, my hope is built on nothing less then Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's sing it together.
Let's pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. He said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not from temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And these words for you as we go out today. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we're to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. <laughs> for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. As in Adam we all die, so in Christ we will all be made alive. <laughs> Be blessed in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, the one true and living God. Go in that truth today. Amen.